How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm trying to keep this a little shorter today because we have a couple of our missionaries, people that we supported, some for a very long time, <laughs> uh, for here with us today, Claire Meckler, who's been uh, a missionary in Sudan for 30 years. Uh, I mean, not Sudan, Africa for 30 years. And she'll tell you more about that. Uh, and then also, uh, Laura Stanley is with us, and she's been over in Hong Kong for the last five years. So anyway, um, whenever I say that, it's like the kiss of death, you know, it goes extra long, but I'm going to try here. Um, so we're in Lent, and, and the overarching theme of Lent is, is the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, because we end up with Holy Week and finally Easter in a few weeks. And uh, I chose these verses for the gospel today for a very important reason, for uh, intentionally. It's not the gospel that was assigned. But I want to give an introduction. Uh, there's a pattern to Matthew's gospel, if you didn't know. Uh, the first half begins with Jesus' ministry and leads up to the point at which Peter announces in response to Jesus' question, who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And so the first half of Matthew's gospel leads up to that point from the point of Jesus calling the disciples and doing his ministry in, Gal in Galilee and such. And then finally, they begin to get it. Who is Jesus really? And then from that point, it goes all the way to the cross. So that's, that's the, the two divisions of the Gospel of Matthew. And after, as soon as Peter figured out who Jesus was, Jesus begins to give him more. And it wasn't very pleasant. Jesus, we read, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and the third day be raised. And we all probably remember Peter's response to that. It was, no, 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 Jesus. Don't be such a downer. You have to think more positively. You know, read a self-help book. You'll, you'll feel better about yourself. The future is bright. You're the Messiah. But Jesus knew what was going to happen, and he was just telling him the truth. And, you know, in Mark's gospel, he brings out the point that they never did really understood it. They never did really get it until it happened. And, of course, uh, after Peter rebuked, Jesus, Jesus turned around and rebuked him and said, you know, you're not looking at things from God's perspective. You really don't know what you're talking about, Peter. Um, you know, I have to do this. I have to go to the cross. So uh, Jesus, again, was trying to not only tell them what was about what was going to happen, but what it was going to be like to follow him because they had visions of grandeur. We're going to be, you know, we're going to be the Messiah's right and left-hand guys. You know, we're going to, it's going to be fantastic. You know, we're going to rule the world. And so Jesus, uh, Jesus lays it out for them. Listen to these words, because they're shocking. They never cease to shock me. And fr quite frankly, to, to just jolt me. Jesus says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Wow. But what does that mean? Uh, there, there's a corollary verse, by the way, in Matthew 10, a few chapters earlier, where Jesus said, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. 
Now, when I was a kid in church and I read or I heard these verses, I had an image in my mind. And that was because I was an acolyte like you guys. I was an acolyte and, and I imagined carrying a cross, that that's kind of what Jesus meant. I needed to pick up like the, the processional cross and that was symbolic of what it meant to follow Jesus. But that's not at all what Jesus was talking about. Even though Jesus predicted that he was going to die and rise, he didn't say a word about him being crucified. Uh, they were truly shocked when all that came to pass on Good Friday. So what did it mean long before they knew he was going to be crucified that he, when he said, if you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross. What did that mean? So we need a little bit of background. Unfortunately, I have to talk about crucifixion because that's what this is about. Uh, no way around it. I'm not going to get into the gory details, but we're going to talk about what it meant in the first century. Um, I'm sure that some of you have heard maybe even a sermon in this church. You've heard someone say something like that we really don't get the significance of the cross uh, because we wear it as a, as a piece of jewelry uh, or dangling from our ears or we've got it printed you know, on something, and how that would sort of be tantamount to wearing a little chain with a little electric chair hanging off the end of it. You know, um, that's kind of weird, right? Well, that kind of gets to where I'm going with this, but doesn't go nearly far enough. Um, I'm going to read from Surprise, Surprise, a book by N.T. Wright, I know. It seems like that he's the only guy I quote these days. But anyway, um, so I'm going to read a little bit from this book called The Day the Revolution Began, Reconsidering the Meaning of Jesus' Crucifixion. That sounds like a scary title. It sounds like he's a heretic or something. It's, 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 it's a fantastic book. So... He talks about this in, in the chapter called The Cross in Its First Century Setting. He says, Few readers of this book are likely to have seen, except on screen, meaning TV or movies, the kind of violence that was common in the first century. Even those who watch Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ might either screen out the gratuitous, gratuitous horror of it all or be so overwhelmed by the physical brutality as to miss the point that such a death was designed to degrade as well as to kill. Crucifixion was one of the central ways in which authorities in the ancient world set out quite deliberately to show subject peoples who was in charge and to break the spirit of any resistance. Crucifixion was, after all, one of the most horrible fates that humans could devise. This isn't a modern overstatement. It was even, it was the considered opinion of the Roman orator Cicero and the Jewish historian Josephus, two men who had seen plenty of crucifixions, and also another who knew what he was talking about, the church father Origen. Cicero refers to crucifixion as the most cruel and terrifying penalty Josephus speaks of a Jewish protest against, quote, the most pity pitiable of deaths. And Origen refers to it as, quote, the most shameful form of death, namely the cross, end of quote. The point is often made but bears repetition. We in the modern West who wear jeweled crosses around our necks, stamp them on Bibles and prayer books and carry them out in cheerful processions, need regularly to be reminded that the very word cross 
is a word that you would most likely not utter in polite society. You didn't even say the word back then. The thought of it would not only put you off your dinner, it would give you sleepless nights. And if you had actually seen a crucifixion or two, as many in the Roman world would have, your sleep would have been invaded by nightmares as the memories came flooding back unbidden. Memories of humans half alive and half dead, lingering on perhaps for days on end, covered in blood and flies, nibbled by rats, pecked at by crows, with weeping and helpless relatives still keeping watch, and with hostile or mocking crowds adding, to their, in, adding their insults to the terrible injuries. Wow. Boy, I mean, it's... But we have to talk about the cross because Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection are the very center of what we believe about this good news, this mystery of the good news. Uh, and so, just to kind of recap really quickly, first of all, crucifixion was one of the most horrible deaths possible. Secondly, it was a very common sight among people in the first century in Israel. You couldn't walk down a highway they weren't like highways today, but you know what I mean. A road, a big main road, because that's where the Romans put them. They put them along the highway so everybody would see. Third, it was how the Romans made a public example, particularly of slaves and rebels. Jesus was a rebel leader in their minds. A notable example of this, you've probably all heard, heard, read or seen the movie Spartacus a long time ago. Well, that's kind of fictional. The real Spartacus lived a hundred years before Jesus. And uh, when he was defeated, his 6,000 soldiers were all crucified along the 130-mile stretch of the Appian Way from Rome to Capua. That was a cross every 40 yards for 130 miles. Do you think Rome was trying to send a message to its populace about rebelling? It's a horrible thought, but that, that regularly happened in this ancient world that we, that we are reading about in our Bible. Uh, <clears throat> and so... Uh, if you even barely had a thought of rebelling against the authorities, you, you probably rethought it pretty quickly. Uh, fourth, those who were crucified were mocked by those who passed by. This was part of it. It's not an anomaly that Jesus was mocked in the Bible as he was on the cross by the chief priests and those guys. That was the normal thing. That was what you were supposed to do. It's sort of like back in Puritan times when they would put people in the stocks and, you know, throw rotten apples at them and, you know, jeer. We read about that. Well, this, this was worse. Some guy, poor guy, is dying up there on the cross and people are supposed to walk by and insult him. That was, that was part of the game. So, um, so all together... So the public humiliation was very much a part of it. All fifth number, all these things together mean that to be crucified was shameful beyond description to the point that no one ever even discussed it. It was that shameful. Even though you saw it every day, no one talked about it. It wasn't considered a good thing to discuss. It just was. So, it's in that background, that context, that Jesus says to his disciples, do you want to follow me? If anyone wants to follow me, he must take up his cross and do so, and deny himself. 
Wow. Well, those who were on the cross had lost everything, everything. So in essence, Jesus was saying, and I only picked out four things this morning, you must choose between your family and me. In Matthew 10, 37, again, a corollary passage to the one we have this morning, Jesus said, whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Well, doesn't God want us to love our relatives? Yes, he does. He wants us to love them with the same love he has toward us. But he's first. Otherwise, our relationships become idolatry. God is first. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Then love everyone else as he's loved us. Secondly, we have to choose between our own life and Jesus, our own life, our own will. And this is, this is something we face every single day. We're faced with countless choices between God's will and my will. And we, whether it's denying appetites or... Um, activities or engaging in work that we would rather not do when we are followers of jesus he is lord we're not and so we have to choose between our life and the life that he has for us i mean again every one of these verses is enough to make you stop and ponder it for a day or more Just stop and think. What does it mean that if I want to save my life, in Matthew 10, 39, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Choosing God's will over my will. Third, possessions. Matthew 16, 26, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Our whole world is designed to encourage people to choose possessions, material things, wealth, over more valuable things, like family, like relationships, like serving the Lord, Jesus, in the parable of the sower, talked about the weeds that choke out the good seed that would grow up and bear fruit, but doesn't get to because it gets choked out. Sometimes we have to make career choices that are difficult for our families, for our own health, whatever. I've known a lot of people as a pastor for the last 35 years who've worked their tails off until they died. Was it worth it? They're, usually their widows didn't think so. Reputation. This verse isn't right in this section, but again, it's in the corollary section where Jesus talked about the same thing back in or in in Mark's gospel, he says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the angels. Uh, Very sad story from not even a few weeks old. Pastor Tim Keller, founding pastor of Church of the Redeemer in New York City, a church that has then helped plant another several hundred churches of all denominations. They didn't care. You want to plant a church, we'll help you. We're just about getting the gospel out. Uh, written some of the best books I've ever read. One of the, if you want to know who I listen to for preaching inspiration, I listen to Tim Keller. You know, I know, you can skip the middleman now. You can just go listen to Tim Keller. 
I encourage you to listen to Tim Keller's podcast. That he's got the best preacher. Gosh, he's so wonderful. He's so brilliant and inspirational. I listen to him. Hopefully a little bit of what he says come through, comes through my preaching. But, you know, he went to Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, and so when he was retiring, they decided to honor him with, you know, this great uh, honor, the, uh, the, I can't even pronounce it, the Kuiper Prize for Excellence in Reformed Theology and Public Witness. And not as soon as they had announced this, they had students and teachers at the theological seminary objecting because, oh my gosh, he believes the Bible. He thinks marriage ought to be between a man and a woman. We can't give a guy like that this award. He thinks God intended sex to be between two married people. We can't give him an award. He's a homophobe. He's a, you know, he's a terrible person. So they withdrew it. Princeton Theological Seminary withdrew the award. Now, I, I have to at least commend the president a little bit because he said that they were still going to invite him to come speak. Now, let me tell you something. Tim Keller is the real deal, and he's still going to go talk about Jesus. And we should pray for that. We should pray for that because... He will model how Jesus would respond in a situation like that. But here's this man's reputation. This guy's a superstar among Christians, in my opinion, as a teacher, as a preacher. And the world, which now has infected Princeton Theological Seminary, is, de is denouncing him. They're denouncing him. So, when Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow me, you have to take up your cross, he's saying, you have to be willing to give it all up and literally to suffer and literally to experience rejection and humiliation. That's what his disciples understood him to be saying that day when he said this to them. I don't know about you. I wouldn't be surprised if some of them said, ah, that's okay. Thanks, Jesus. I'll come listen to you occasionally. I think you're a great speaker, but that went too far. That was, that was too much, Jesus. I mean, that's just too, that's, that's too graphic. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, for the Son of Man is going to come in his glory of his Father, the glory of his Father and his angels, and he will then repay every man according to his deeds. Well, I, I don't think that means every little thing you ever did. I think he means the choices you made, like to follow him or to ignore his call to follow him. I think that's what he meant. And he says there's a reward. And we don't have time to go into all the reward, but we preach every Sunday. And the reward is this life, this life that he gives us through his Holy Spirit, this life, this what he called eternal life. Eternal life doesn't begin when you die. It begins when you receive Christ in your heart and it extends past our natural death. That's life. He called it abundant life. Life on a higher plane than this material world will ever understand. Spiritual life. We can even call it resurrection life because Paul says we enter into the death and resurrection of Jesus. So we have the reward. We don't have to wait until Christ returns. We don't have to wait till we die. We begin to receive that when we receive Jesus into our hearts. And finally, he makes a promise that uh, 
that is a little misunderstood, I think. He says, truly, I say to you, there are some of those who are, stand, who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. They say, well, he must have gotten that wrong. Yeah, you know, Jesus, you know, he, he must have made a mistake when he said that because obviously Christ has not returned yet and everybody who was there 2,000 years ago is, is dead. So Jesus must have made a mistake. But I, I believe that Jesus was speaking metaphorically. When he says the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, I believe that Jesus was speaking of the kingdom beginning to come on the day of resurrection. That's when the kingdom of God began to break into this world. And so it would make a whole lot more sense when he says, there are those standing here who will not die until they see with their own eyes the Son of Man coming. I believe it was metaphorical. So there were some who were standing there that day, and that is Jesus' promise. It doesn't end with the humiliation and the, and the horror of crucifixion. It ends with God's glory and God's victory as the Son of Man comes in his kingdom into our lives and into this world. I want to take a moment and ask you to bow your heads. And let's just take a moment and think about Jesus' call. If anyone wants to follow me, let him take up his cross and deny himself. Lord, your words are so challenging. They shake us to the core of our being. We have to think about this, Lord. We have to count the cost. Lord, we haven't denied ourselves. We've denied you. Forgive us. Lord, so many times we've chosen to save our life instead of to lose it for you. And we've missed out on the life that you wanted to give us. Lord, there have been times when we've chosen family over you, or friends over you, or activities, hobbies, things we like to do over you. There have been times when we've put our reputation before you. We've chosen to keep our mouths shut when we probably should have said something because we didn't want people to think less of us. We didn't identify with you, Lord. We distanced ourselves from you. And Lord, as far as our possessions are concerned, so many times we just acted as though they were ours and not your gift to us. And we haven't sought you and prayed for your will and your guidance in using our finances for your service. Lord, in all these ways, we have chosen self above you, our will above your will. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us. And Lord, help us to understand the promise that you have for us and for all those who do follow you of life, life in your spirit, life in relationship to you and to the Father, a life that is an amazing life, 
abundant, beyond words. Lord, help us to choose life. In Jesus' name, amen.